Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, thanks, Emily. Uh, so today, I want to talk a little bit about a project that has been a long time in the making um, in Foundry and is uh, now on its way to uh, the open source community. Um, and we, uh, we worked really hard to try to uh, align everything we were doing with this project with uh, the mission and uh, the way the Academy uh, works with open source projects. So a little bit of this presentation is about what open asset IO is. Uh, a little bit is about how we brought it to the Academy Software Foundation to its uh, path to adoption. Uh, and uh, a little bit uh, is about, I guess, uh, the origins and why, you know, why we did this. Uh, and you know what? What exactly is Open Asset IO, and why should we care about it as a, as a as a community and as an industry? So, uh, I'll start with um, there we go. Start by introducing myself and uh, my other two colleagues who are here in spirit. Uh, so I'm Matt Maserwell. Uh I work with Foundry's research team. Um, Foundry Research is a little bit different than some of the other teams. Uh, what we do is work on kind of really speculative stuff, uh, essentially moonshots or things that may or may not pay off. Uh, my job specifically is to figure out you know, what actually might pay off and figure out how to bring that into the hands of artists and engineers and uh, you know, people who can actually make use of it. Uh, we're divided into essentially, I'd say, three kind of rough areas. Uh, we have research work in the area of machine learning. Uh, we have uh, research work in the area of uh, real time, which today is you know, kind of synonymous with uh, virtual production uh, and those types of uh, applications. Um, and we have a research uh, area around what we call cloud. And OpenAsset.io was born from uh, our cloud team. And uh, the, uh, the main folks we have working in that area are my colleague Tom Cowland and David Feltel. And uh, if you join the Open Asset IO community and work with us through GitHub, um, you'll get to know uh, Tom and David, uh, at the very least through their GitHub IDs. Uh, but they're also real people, and you can join our working groups and see them in person. They're, they're wonderful. Um, sadly, they're not here today, but um, they're, they're just even more important than I am to um, the story of Open Asset IO. So I'll start with Open Asset IO before getting into like what it is and how we brought it to the Academy, um, I guess I'll start a little bit with like an origin story of why we're why we, you know why we start working in this area. Um, a long time ago, uh, before COVID, uh, if we can still remember that, uh, Foundry was super curious about cloud. Uh, cloud. We had research uh, efforts in cloud. And we actually ended up launching a commercial product uh, in the cloud space, which sadly was not successful, and we, we discontinued it. Uh, but we really put a tremendous amount of work and effort into uh, trying to build a you know, virtual studio in the cloud, you know, really going for like a turnkey solution where you could you know, rent software by the month, which was like a complete change to business models. Uh, running content creation applications in the cloud on a web browser, on virtual machines, doing distributed compute. Everything was container-based, Microsoft. It was like we were clicking all the buttons of like building a cloud service, and this was like 2017. Uh, but the world wasn't really ready for it. And uh, interestingly, now in COVID, everyone would be like, oh, yeah, this all sounds like a great idea. Um, but that's kind of not the point. The point was uh, we went headfirst into the cloud space, and uh, despite not really being successful uh, at a commercial level with what we were doing, at a research level and at a really kind of a deep understanding of cloud technology and what it meant to how people actually put it to work in production pipelines, we learned a tremendous amount, uh, a, l a lot of stuff about uh, what people were sensitive to, what worked, what didn't work. Um, but one thing that we realized coming out of that project was just the absolute importance of how bad the problem of managing data is when you move to cloud. Um, I'm going to tell a little story with pictures. 
Um, by the way, Tom drew all the pictures, so I'm just sort of, I'm not a good artist. If you see these pictures and you think they're cool, uh, you can thank Tom for them. Um, but this is essentially how we started reasoning about the problem of uh, data, distributed data, and kind of the hybrid and sort of you know, cloud-centric world that we, we were sort of slowly moving to, but why it's like super hard and why we need something like Open Asset IO to make it, uh, to make it better and why an open source approach is the right way. Um, so a long time ago, this would be like your studio, right? You would have uh, some people that uh, were awesome and knew how to you know, win some work and you get uh, some infrastructure together and uh, let's say this is a VFX studio and these cool stick figures are all using you know, Nuke and some other stuff. And you got a little data center down there. That's the IT person, he's a little tired. Um, and you're, you know, you're, you're cranking away and things are going good. Uh, but you know, things are scaling up and your studio is becoming bigger. Um, so you end up needing you know, a bigger data center. So maybe you've got something uh, kind of off-prem, uh, like a you know, colloque or something like that. And just having a whole bunch of files sitting around on like a you know, network storage or a SAN system or something like that, like it's not cutting it anymore. So you, you go and you get an asset management system to uh, start to kind of organize your files into something more workflow centric. So wherever you see AMS, um, think asset management system and think either you know, the custom stuff you're probably using in a studio or Shotgun or F-Track or some of the commercial solutions which are you know, also typically highly customized for your specific needs. But then you grow even more, right? So your studio gets even bigger and now you've got like another even bigger location in a whole different area with another you know, kind of set of uh, machines and data center and storage and people and that's all, that's all kind of getting big and distributed. And then all of a sudden, COVID hits, right? So all the people are gone, except for your IT people who you know, are still kind of managing all your data servers and stuff, and everybody's at home. And uh, if you guys all remember, at the beginning of COVID, um, the immediate solution was to wire everybody from their home remotely into the machines that already physically existed within the studios, right? Um, you know, that was the year that, for example, Caradici uh, uh, kind of saved the day. And, um, you know, suddenly, you know, <laughs> when we had our cloud product, everyone was like, there's no way I'll be able to do visual effects from a Starbucks on an internet connection. And that's precisely what happened when COVID hit. And we just sort of figured it out and it worked, right? We all start to trust the technology and processes came in. And we even start to look at, hey, you know, we've got all these you know, uh, file servers and things laying around and we're even more distributed than before because these people working from home aren't just the people who were there in the studio before, but now they're like new people we're hiring and freelancers. So now, you know, we can take advantage of cloud to sort of glue stuff together. So this is like the new thing we're, we're all looking at. But here's the challenge is where's, you know, where, where's your data? Um, where are your files? Where are your assets? Are they all the same thing? Right? What, what, you know, what is the relationship between all those things? So now it kind of looks like this, right? You've got files like kind of literally everywhere. And you know, really this isn't the way we, we typically work, right? We typically look, work in a way where we think of assets and groups of assets uh, as you know, you're working on a shot or a project or something. And there's this kind of like a, a logical abstraction around files. And then what we have to do is figure out how do we go and actually fetch those things from all these different storage systems and move them around and organize them into folders and remap the folders. And you know, I'm probably boring you all to death and giving you all um, uh, you know, uh, some kind of twitch talking about this. Um, and sadly, um, this is our application, Nuke, which is uh, awesome. But this could be any other application, um, you know, Maya or Houdini or whatever. Like we, you know, all the applications talk files, right? We don't talk assets. Uh, we don't talk in terms of like logical things that are meaningful to uh, an artistic task of some kind. That's sort of the domain of these, you know, asset management systems. And you know, people in this room who are pipeline engineers and, and who uh, write infrastructure for studios to be able to to work efficiently. Um, that's so 90s, right? Like this stuff hasn't changed in, <laughs> since the dawn, dawn of time. I mean, I've, 
uh, I, I'm probably not as um, experienced as some people in here, but you know, I worked on content creation applications uh, in, in the mid 90s and you know, I don't think a lot has changed, right? There's still the old file open and uh, mapping directories and, and all that stuff. So um, with asset management systems in the picture uh, and with all these applications that we have, uh, what happens now is in order to kind of get around the, the, the to get, you know, take, take advantage of the fact that they provide a nice abstraction, all these asset management systems are a nice abstraction over files, we have to connect them together. So the world kind of looks like this today, right? And depending on whether you're using your own asset management system or one of these things, you probably have a bunch of tools that have to glue to these things and speak some kind of language to find assets and somehow resolve them to files and find their related files and uh, build some kind of structure and coherence to them. And every studio, and whether that's uh, you know, somebody you're working with uh, on, uh, let's say on a show who's not part of your particular corporation, but they're like a, involved in the show, or it might be a sister studio, or it might be a new studio your company has just acquired, they might all have different things, right? And you're constantly struggling to uh, reevaluate like how do I update my asset management system or abstract it or um, you know you're just constantly writing all this this glue right so this is what led us to think about open asset IO uh, open asset IO was born from um, kind of the pain of understanding cloud and then realizing that hey uh, before we can even think about moving to cloud and fancy microservices and you know uh, elastic and um, you know horizontal scaling we should probably have a language for talking about assets and data otherwise we'll never be able to get things to the right place for the right people to do the right job whether that's a person a machine or a workload or, or whatever um, so open asset io is it's a way of uh, uh, finding and uh, uh, finding and sharing connectly de uh, deeply connected assets and it's kind of regardless of where they're stored. So what does that mean practically? Well, you could go to uh, GitHub and look at the API. That's like the quickest way. Uh, but briefly, it's a very, very simple, thin API that has like a client side and a manager side. And it allows them to talk about things using uh, an ID-based system. And then they can say, hey, this, you know, this asset here, you can actually go find it on S3 with this uh, S3 URL. And by the way, here's a bunch of other related things to it. Like that's the shot, but by the way, you know, here's the lens distortion grid and the camera metadata and all the stuff that goes with it. So it's a nice little uh, way of finding uh, assets and connections between them. And it standardizes asset-centric workflows. So that means, you know, more, so it's a standard, meaning that if you write to open asset IO, you can have a client that can talk to different manager backends. So that makes it really handy that if you want to talk to, let's say, S3 and F-Track or whatever, you want to move an asset with a certain ID to another subsystem, um, you don't have to change the front end. You don't need to write new uh, application side code in order to, uh, in order to you know, look at the same assets. You can just do things by adapting the, the manager side. Um, Open Asset IO also does nice things. It's not just for finding deeply connected assets. It's also great because uh, it allows you to mint new assets, right? So you can tell Open Asset IO, you tell the manager, like, I, I want to make this new asset, and here's the related things. Uh, it lets you get metadata about assets. Um, and we're looking at future projects as well, which is going to be beyond Open Asset IO for sort of building manifests or closures around assets. You can package them up and move them through tasks. But the foundation really is this super simple. Uh, thin layer API that's actually, um, this all sounds like, wow, um, Foundry was really clever for thinking of this. This actually comes from a lot of work. If anybody here has used Katana uh, and had a look at the Katana asset API, uh, and there's other similar uh, types of APIs in other applications, but particularly the Katana asset API was the inspiration for this work. Uh, and we've really kind of greatly extended it and added it to the Katana asset API uh, to uh, build open asset IO. Um, so, this is what the world looks like, and this is the world with Open Asset IO, essentially. Uh, so that's the part about Open Asset IO, and I'm going to switch now to talking a little bit about uh, what, how we ended up where we are now, which is uh, Open Asset IO was recently 
uh, embraced by the Academy as the very first sandbox level project in the project lifecycle. So um, if you don't know, the, the, the ASWF has a, a lifecycle model for projects, and the earliest phase is the sandbox phase, where you know, the project is sort of you know, finding its way, building a community isn't necessarily at V1, but the Academy will give resources and uh, encouragement to help bring it to the next phase, which is incubation. When you're in the incubation phase, you're essentially getting uh, yourself fully in shape. You know, you're like Rocky, you're training, uh, getting ready for the match. And then the final phase obviously is adoption in your fully adopted project. So we're the first project to go through this life cycle process uh, at the early phase of, of Sandbox. Uh, so we're really happy with that. So how did we end up there? Well, when we started Open Asset IO, um, we actually uh, were really deliberate about this being an open source effort from the very beginning. And that was, uh, being deliberate about that took a lot of reflection and consideration about uh, what it meant to do it right and what the value of taking that path really was, and we had to rationalize that that value was actually meaningful and important, not just to Foundry, but to uh, the industry at large. Um, one thing that really uh, drove us to understand why open source was the right way was uh, sustainability. Um, you know, when you're trying to do something like offer an API to take applications out of the 90s and talking to files, um, you know, you're not going to get that from, you know, whatevercompany.com, that has to be something that everybody can uh, fully use and that is going to last, uh, you know, it's going to withstand the test of like years and years of being integrated into, into pipelines. You know, we look at things like OpenEXR and other technologies that we use, like we almost take for granted the fact that they have proven themselves to be like super sustainable, right? So we kind of saw that as like that being really necessary for what we're trying to do with the project. Um, pervasiveness, you know, you really need a big community. This, for open asset IO to be successful, it has to be much bigger than anything we could do alone as a, a company or even as a, a community. We had to engage like the whole industry in a broader cross section of people. Uh, and that really made us think that the, the academy was really like the, you know, the right, uh, the right venue for that. If the academy didn't exist, uh, I think this would have been a lot harder because we wouldn't have had the, you know, the nexus of open source for, uh, for, for m and &E that we do. Uh, but that pervasiveness, we really, uh, we really saw the ability to tap into it. Um, flexibility, going open source really kept us, you know, forced us to keep us honest around the design and uh, just making sure that we took a lot of input and really built a community and listened to the community and built it in a way that wasn't just for our particular needs, but for everybody's needs. And also because uh, Open Asset IO is not a library that you, you know, you download and suddenly your application is magically open asset IOized, right? It's a foundation and it's a way of thinking about stuff. And uh, it's a foundation that uh, we're hoping everybody will slowly build on top of. So those were our reasons for taking the open source path. Um, I put a picture of a, a monk climbing stairs because I really think of the work that we do on open asset IO almost as like a, a, a travail de moine, like a, a monk's work. Um, it's, it's, uh, slow, deliberate, uh, forward movement. Um, and uh, coming to the Academy. So, you know, Foundry was a, one of the founding members among many others of uh, the Academy. Uh, we're very active. We participate in the governance. Uh, we, we love interacting with uh, the, the folks who govern the Academy and we like to get involved in trying to make uh, everything in, the, in, in ASWF successful. Um, and uh, we've, you know, contributed code to projects uh, and we're big users of a lot of the projects in the Academy, but we've never actually given anything, you know, in terms of like a project to the Academy. This was a big step, you know. Uh, I think <laughs> if we imagine when we, we actually got involved in the ASWF, I don't think we ever came in with this idea that we were suddenly going to like have all these projects that were sitting around that we were going to like turn into you know, adopted Academy Software Foundation project. But when we identified what we were doing with Open Asset IO, we really saw a great fit. We're like, this is great. But we had already kind of set the table by being active with the Academy. And more importantly, just understanding how things work, understanding who the people are, what the aims are, uh, just what, how things, you know, how things get done and uh, how to do things like right and do them sustainably. That was really important. 
Um, so by the way, this is the part of the talk where if you, if you have an open source project or you want to get more involved with the Academy, um, this is maybe helpful, right? Because this is sort of our journey. Uh, and it's a great, great thing to keep in mind if you, if you want to get more involved with the Academy, which I strongly, uh, I strongly urge you to, uh, to think about. Uh, I'm sure there's open asset IOs or things like that in, in many of our companies where we can uh, pool our efforts. So this is kind of what got us going with ASWF. Um, so how did we actually do it? Well, we said we had to do it right from the very start, right? So uh, from the very get-go, when you've got an open source project, sometimes you sort of do it your own way with your own coding standards and, you know, you set your GitHub stuff up, but it's not really kind of done, you know, the uh, Linux Foundation way, right? So we're like, no, we're going to do it the Linux Foundation way from the start. We, we actually started the GitHub repo for OpenAsset.io almost as like a, a copycat of... Uh, an ASWF project, and we even uh, set up uh, like working groups and things like that. We even modeled kind of the governance of how open uh, how ASWF projects are governed, because it was kind of our gold, you know, kind of the gold standard, right? And uh, that would turn out to be really useful because it meant that when we finally were ready to approach the academy about uh, the the sandbox phase, uh, it was it was much easier for people to go through. And you don't have to call out like, oh, hey, you don't have uh, you know, a, a well-defined contribution process, or you're using the wrong type of license, or you know, like your discussion channels are all closed and private. Um, we, we actually kind of looked at all the best practices of all the, the open source projects in the Academy and what, what the, the gold standard was and tried, uh, tried to follow them. Uh, this required patience um, because it meant that from the get-go, even with just our own resources, before we had built out a community, before we were engaging with the Academy, uh, we were trying to do things uh, kind of at a, a you know, the, the ASWF way, but it also, that cost us velocity, uh, but what we lost in velocity, uh, we gained in sustainability, and that patience, uh, I think, really paid off. Um, and. Uh, you know, and the other thing we had to do that we thought was really important is, you know, and I strongly encourage this as well, if you've got a project, um, don't just think about putting your code into GitHub and having all, you know, uh, looking nice and Linux foundation-y. Uh, really think about the community, right? The open source projects don't live and die by their code. They live and die by the people who work with it and what they give to it and how they give input on it. So we work really hard to uh, build a community, and we're still working really hard. This is still mission number one uh, for the project, is uh, to continue to build a thriving community. And it's really hard, and it takes a long time, uh, but it's been really amazing. I mean, there's people there who we have active collaborations with. The little P dot, that's, uh, that's OpenPipe, uh, who do, uh, who do a, uh, an open source uh, production pipeline. Uh, Movie Labs, which is a, an amazing think tank, we're working with the Open Timeline IO people. Uh, Autodesk, as well, has just been an amazing, uh, amazing, great group of people who think really, really, uh, you know, really sharply about asset-based workflows. And we've had people coming into our working groups and participating in discussion forums on GitHub uh, from all these great companies, which is awesome. And we're hoping to turn more people into active collaborators. Um, please think about adding yourself to the list. Um, it's easy. I'll tell you how to get involved uh, in a minute. Um, so how did we approach the, once we, so once we felt like we were, you know, in good shape and our shirt was ironed and, you know, we had a, a kind of a, a budding uh, community, uh, how, did, how did we, you know, how did we approach the ASWF? Well, you know, we looked at the sandbox, uh, you know, the, the, kind of the specs for the sandbox phase. Uh, we tried to understand the life cycle process. Uh, and most importantly, uh, I, just had a Zoom call with John Murtick. I don't know if John's here, but um, he's super helpful. Uh, you know, just saying like, how do we do this? And you know, kind of going through the checklist. Um, and then you just make a, you make a, a, a pitch. You describe what you're doing, why it's important, why it's aligned with the Academy's values, uh, and where you're at uh, with your, you know, just your checklist, your contribution process, your license, your dependencies, uh, you know, your roadmap, and all those things. And then uh, the Academy, will, the, the TAC, will, uh, will have a meeting and look at it and uh, you know, give, give feedback. Um, and that, that's exactly what happened. Um, so it was, was really great. 
And uh, there you go. These were, this is kind of what we did is we, uh, we, we can um, could probably share someday the, the, the actual PowerPoint we used to, to propose the project. But there's you know, a nice list of check boxes that we followed. And if you have a project, think about all these things. Uh, think about your open SSF certification. Think about documenting your contribution model, uh, your obviously your code dependencies, but also think think a lot about how are you engaging with your community. You know, are you holding you know Zoom meetings? Are you keeping recordings or notes? Uh, how are you you know keeping a degree of openness? Because uh, I think that's the really key part about uh, about you know with the, the, to judge the success of a project, an open source project. It's really about that. Is is it thriving? Is important? Are people are people seeing value in it? So uh, now that we've been adopted, uh, well, not adopted, but I guess embraced into the sandbox phase, uh, what's next? So we formed a technical steering committee, which means Tom and David are no longer necessarily in charge. Uh, they're on the technical steering committee and they chair it, but they, you know, they don't necessarily represent Foundry's interests. They represent the interests of the project. And we have a bunch of people not from Foundry also on the technical steering committee. So we're kind of like hugging our, our baby and saying, like, not a baby anymore, like you're going off to college uh, and it's not ours anymore. Uh, and this is great. This is exactly what we think is required. So think about that too. And you're building an open source project that you really want to give to the community is, you know, you need that support uh, internally and from the outside world to separate it from your kind of company's vested interests. And one of the things that I have been most impressed with, and um, you know, I work on a lot of different stuff across Foundry and in different areas, the executive support from the very, very top that we have had to do this and to build something, invest energy, time, money, a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of roadblocks, but to say we're actually going to build this for, this, the, uh, for the stated purpose of giving it away uh, has been tremendous. And that is uh, really, really important is making sure you have that level of support and commitment uh, from your stakeholders. Uh, and we we're very, very uh, lucky to have that at, uh, at Foundry. Uh, and that's Foundry hugging, hugging its precious child goodbye. But, you know, we'll visit on weekends and probably still do its laundry sometimes. So it's okay. Uh, so now we're all about targeting the incubation phase requirements. Just like I said, is building a version one and uh, building, um, building a thriving community. So get involved. Uh, everyone's now thinking like, wow, this open asset I think sounds amazing. Uh, how do I how do I get uh, you know how do I get uh, get into it and how can I learn more and um, everything's there. Uh, go to OpenAssetIO on GitHub. There's all the information about our working groups. We have an ASWF Slack channel, so if you're in the ASWF Slack, join our Slack channel. We have regular design discussions. Currently, our working groups I think are monthly, uh, but I think we're going to probably accelerate those a little bit um, and. You know, help us with pipeline integrations, or even scratch integrations, even just you know design uh, input on the API, anything at all. Like uh, this, in order for this project to really take off, it requires people to not just sort of like be at arm's length and wait for it to happen to them. Um, this is a this is a thing where we all have to build it together. If we want to move out of the '90s and the file-based workflows, this is really the place where we can all come together and talk about it and build something. Um, so get involved and build something around it on top of it. Uh, that's that to me. That's going to be the real measure is the degree to which you don't see open asset IO anymore. It just silently powers things like POSIX used to, which we don't even think about anymore, but is completely ill suited to where we're going in, in terms of the future. Um, and that's it. I want to give a special thanks to, uh, to John, uh, cause he was our Sherpa through this process. Uh, very uh, gentle and supportive. Um, the TAC, amazing. Um, the just the just the level of um, critical thinking they they put the project through before accepting it and really understanding it and being very deliberate about uh, doing you know making sure that there's a, a high quality bar for the types of things that the ASWF interacts with is super appreciated. Uh, so a uh, huge thanks to the TAC uh, and their brain trust. Uh, the community, obviously, everybody who's working with OpenSSIO, huge thanks. Uh, Foundry, of course, our amazing executives and 
developers and our other teams as well, uh, who've all been super supportive of the project. Um, and Tom and Dave, who actually write all the code and uh, make all the real decisions. Um, so that's it. Um, so that's it. Um, I guess, you know, questions, like I said, this was a presentation at multiple levels. Uh, if you have questions about OpenAssetIO itself, uh, we, can, we can go there, talk about how it was contributed to the ASWF, uh, anything at all. Uh, I'm uh, super curious uh, to, hear, um, to hear what's, what's on your minds and uh, what kind of questions folks may have. So I'll open it up. And I demand questions because I heard there weren't a lot of questions in the previous one. So I have one already. <laughs> yes. So um, you mentioned in terms of you know, the files are everywhere. Yeah. Um, does open asset IO have an opinion on kind of where the, the database lives uh, for, for knowing where all those links are? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So the question was, you know, with files sort of distributed everywhere and open asset IO looking to resolve them, does it have an opinion about like where is the database that uh, or the central place that figures out that that relationship and does it have a prescription for that that database? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, open asset IO, uh, if if I channel Tom, it's it's violently unopinionated about those things, but it does create provisions for it. So, for example, if you had an open asset IO shim around, uh, let's say, F-Track, well, F-Track would have its own database. So let's say you've got your own thing and you're storing everything like, let's say, in an Aurora DB on Amazon and you want to build a manager around that, you can. But the nice thing is you can have a client that gives an ID to either one. And if that ID is something that you, know, you can locate in either of those databases, it will get resolved without the client necessarily needing to know, oh, I'm talking to you know, Aurora or F-Track or whatever. So you have to build the abstraction. You know, think of Open Asset IO. Open Asset IO really is a, uh, it's an abstract API, right? It's a virtual class, essentially. And it's all about just trying to make that API uh, look like something that's better than POSIX versus actually prescribing any kind of particular file system. Uh, but that's an excellent question. It's a really good one. We have a question from Zoom. Are you planning to release any integrations or examples for existing asset management systems? That is an excellent question. Yeah, so uh, the question was, are we, are we doing integrations or kind of turnkey integrations for certain asset management systems? Uh, so we're working with the open pipe people, so they're kind of doing that under their own power. We would love to work with, uh, if anyone's from F-Track or uh, ShotGrid here, like, you know, get on board and build an integration. Sadly, Tom and Dave can't do all the integrations for all the things themselves. So what we've done is we've decided to pick uh, a couple of integrations that we know are uh, going to help people the most. Uh, so we've chosen to work mainly on uh, Open Timeline IO media resolvers and provide kind of a, a reference shim for, for that. So you should be able to go, and if you go to the Open Asset IO project, you'll see we have a uh, kind of an affiliated uh, GitHub repo for m and &E workflows where you'll see work being built up around open timeline, uh, open timeline IO integrations. And we're also looking at doing a USD AR2 integration. So kind of like an easy button for AR2. So if you go through the AR2 API, instead of it being something that goes through AR2 and drops directly to a file, it would be AR2 going to open asset IO and then getting your stuff. So if you have other things in your pipeline that are not using USD, uh, and can't make use of AR2 because it's, you know, those, those are non-USD type things, they can still use the exact same asset-based workflow abstraction because AR2 will be sitting on top of open asset AO like everything else. So we think that's useful, or at least maybe it's an example we think people might find handy. So we're working on that as well, kind of doing it under our own power and we'd love help around that stuff as well. Any other questions? Oh. Thank you. So you mentioned about getting rid of files or the concept of a file, but in the end, there's this DCC vendors and they all work with files. So um, how close are we to get rid of files of yeah. network file servers? Yeah, uh, I don't think we'll ever get rid of files in the near term. Um, I like to think maybe somewhere in the far, far future, we won't have 
uh, files strictly. Uh, but I think the intermediate step is uh, try to figure out what represents an asset, and in many cases, that would be a file. So I'll give a specific example. Uh, let's say I resolve a shot through Open Asset IO. It might give me uh, like something that I can use to go and open all of the EXR files for that shot by giving me like a location. But then I might ask for, for example, the lens metadata, and it might give me that directly through the API as, as metadata and not actually a file, right? So kind of like small stuff like that, like data about the files or data about you know certain parts of the asset can all come through OpenAsset.io without files. Uh, but at the end of the day, for to get the actual payload, OpenAsset.io is probably still telling you to go and open a file. Uh, that's not prescribed, but it is one of the things where OpenAsset.io will tell you, I've resolved this asset for you, and by the way, it's a file and it's here. Or it will say, oh, I've resolved this asset for you. By the way, it's this blob of JSON that tells you a bunch of interesting things about that asset. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, besides the entities and hierarchy like a belongs to relationship, are there going to be other relationships that you can model, like a generator relationship or a cache of or you know, to represent the computation to go from one asset to another? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. So the question was, uh, does OpenAssetIO model something other than a hierarchy of assets? So OpenAssetIO doesn't actually model a hierarchy at all. Um, it is a uh, kind of a discoverability model. Uh, probably looks more like GraphQL than anything else. And the view you would get on assets would uh, sort of be dictated by your disposition to uh, like your connection to the, the manager, right? Um, so if you were, let's say, a uh, compositing piece of software or uh, an animation software, right? Those relationships might be different. So it's a discoverability thing. So it'd be like, give me one thing and find me, given that I'm, you know, nuke, find me the other things around this one thing I got. And that relationship, that discovering would happen on the manager side. Probably in the future, that could be more explicit where we could ask uh, a manager to say, hey, cough up you know the group of like cough up the actual graph like I want to see the graph and get a closure of all the assets and that's the sort of the phase two project we're thinking of which we're uh, tentatively calling open data manifests that's uh, when we get like the manpower and the design and stuff around that probably in the next year or so that'll be a, another project we spin up and the idea behind open data manifests is expression expressing closures in groups of assets uh, so that you can actually transport and move them in a way uh, that lets you move them to different either compute fabric or storage systems or people or whatever. So, yeah. Oh, I'll just shout that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to follow on from that, have you looked at um, a piece of software called data version control? Data, uh, have we looked at data version control as a piece of software? GBC. GBC oh, DBC? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really interesting point. Is like, can you can machine learning kind of tell you these things by like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something I'm super super curious about. Um, a former colleague of mine, Phil Peterson, has applied machine learning to production workflows way way back. I mean, the I think that that's a an, an underexploited area. I know there are asset management systems and things that use machine learning to give insights and also kind of make efficiencies. That's not something we've actively looked at yet, uh, but we would love to have that type of discussion in the working group, and uh, hopefully we can support those things with Open Asset IO. I wouldn't say we would add that kitchen sink into the project, but if you can build a house with Open Asset IO in that, uh, that would be amazing. But yeah. Uh, just, just to be clear, DVC is something that's an asset system for machine learning. Oh, okay. Ah, okay, that's interesting. I haven't looked into it. Uh, I'll have a look into it after this, yeah. Oh, it has. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Then I'm in the dark. Like, fantastic. Smarter than smarter people than me at Foundry have looked into DBC. Is the answer. <laughs> All right.
Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone.